Welcome back to the C Mask Podcast. Hope everyone's doing well. We've got all of us here today, me, Mike, Nick, and Tim. And I'm sure you've heard enough about Trump already. So we're not talking about that today. We're talking about the story of Joseph from the Old Testament. This is Genesis 37 to 50. And if you're a guy who's just becoming interested in Christianity and don't know much about it, then I think this is a great starting point starting place for learning about um, why this is a masculine religion, how it can help you live better. Guys, how are you doing today? Excited to talk about this. Uh Uh-huh. Why is that, Nick? Uh, Because it just struck me as you were introing it, um, how powerful the story is and why I'm, I was realizing how confused I was that Hollywood has never tried to make a good version of like the vast majority of biblical stories. And this would have made like just an absolute tearjerker, such a deep emotional masculine story. And it sucks that like Hollywood just never touches. Just go to the old Testament. There's so many unbelievably good stories from there. And this is one of them that would have made like a blockbuster movie if Hollywood cared at all. Yeah. Right. It's almost like scripture was inspired or something. Something like that, by like a really creative, thoughtful narrator or something. I don't know. Right. And um, when you describe it as a tearjerker there, one of the things it does so well, it shows you how the, you can have all kinds of really difficult challenges, but eventually things will work out okay. Like everyone loves stories like that. And there's a line in Sirach 2.5 that I love from the Bible, one of my favorite ones. Gold and silver are tested in the fire and acceptable men in the furnace of humiliation. The furnace of humiliation. And I'm sure I'm sure that's something that we can all think about from our own lives. And I've got a a friend at the moment who's going through some tough times and he's a really good man. And you can also see how the tough times are making them even better. Like they work as a furnace so they can actually form your character even more. Tim, Joseph's story, what does it mean to you? Just as like an opening thought about it. Nick saying that he can't believe it hasn't been made into a big Hollywood film. I can't believe it hasn't been made into a film either, uh, mainly just because of the opportunities that Hollywood would have to translate into a really great rom-com. <laughs> it was a joke, yeah, but um, <laughs> um, I, yeah, I mean, I think this is a great topic for suffering for humility. When you first presented the idea, I was thinking you meant Itayad, Yosef, the, you know, the, the spouse, the blessed spouse of yeah. Virgin Mary. And I love, I love the concept um, as I learned, you meant Joseph, uh, test in the fires of humiliation. I love this concept because as much, uh, beautiful meekness, second greatest of all the saints that, that St. Joseph sort of father of fathers provides us, uh, Joseph, but you know, after the, the patriarch fathers of the old Testament really shows that um it's not just about humility humility it's about humiliation and if a lot of men who are listening to us don't understand that humility does involve humiliation um at some times then they're then they're going to learn to reject that form of suffering and pretty much any form of suffering especially humiliation that's not self-imposed can be sanctifying. So I I think it's a a great topic. Yeah. Great idea there about how people want to reject humiliation. and don't see that it has a deeper spiritual purpose. Mike, this idea of having to grow as a man through suffering, what's your immediate thought about it? Well, I mean, it's, there's no possibility of growth without it. And I know I always bring things back because I'm a, I'm a meathead. I don't, you know, I don't try to hide that at all. Um, the greatest things in my life, I've always related as a bit of a metaphor to to training and the 
the degree of which I've seen my body grow and change through the stressors of external resistance, how much more can be said about when the spirit is tested through a similar kind of resistance, right? We're talking about muscular hypertrophy and neurological adaptations to strength, but it's really, it's a little bit harder to parse out what happens spiritually when we're put through these trials. And in fact, what brought me back to Catholicism was the worst year of my life where I experienced a humility, a, a bit of a humiliation, uh, suffering. Much of it was vain suffering at the hands of, of, of addiction, but nevertheless, you know, um, this period of time of, of desolation, of, of this quietness, distance from God, this dryness in prayer. But still somehow, I mean, somehow now looking back, reflecting, it was the grace of God that guided me through that. And no kidding, it led to this revelation of, of my reversion. And to to Nick's point as well about why hasn't this been made into a Hollywood film? I think part of it is uh, chastity is not sexy to talk about, <laughs> right? If you think yeah. about, and it's so crazy to me, St. Joseph doesn't get a whole lot of love or like recognition. Maybe at least me com coming into the faith, I'm saying, obviously we see all this stuff about the Blessed Mother, of Christ, of all these incredible fathers, church fathers, but... St. Joseph almost sometimes gets overlooked. The most chaste man to ever live, obviously, other than our Lord Jesus Christ. There's so much to take from that. And one thing that stuck out to me, Will, that I use with all of my guys in their in, in my, my coaching clients with regards to battling lust, I remember you recommended a 33-day consecration to St. Joseph. I thought that was so brilliant. And so since then, when I've recommended it to the men that are struggling, like 95% of them that make it through end up conquering it. It's a beautiful thing. What a, what an incredible example we have in, you know, the beloved St. Joseph. I'm excited to talk about this today. That's awesome. And yeah, thinking about the link between chastity and masculinity gets us into some of the areas we often talk about regarding why so-called free love was promoted during the sexual revolution as part of feminism as the best way to actually enslave men. So we can never talk too much about that. Um, um, can I jump in to build off one thing yeah, Mike said with respect to training? Because, <clears throat> uh, Will, I, I just mentioned this to you the other day, that one, I think one of the most profound things that I've heard you talk about that you said that you got from the lives of the saints is that... Um, at, for a man, every, you have to recommit yourself every single day to pick up the burden. And every day that you instead hope that it's not there or think that you can outsmart it or think that you can work hard enough today so that it won't be there tomorrow or next week, you're just a bitch. You're, you're, you're effeminate. This is not how it works. Every single day you're supposed to pick that up. And as Mike was talking about training, um, my mind went to the the idea of progressive overload, right? The only way that you're actually growing muscle is is through progressive overload. That incrementally you're adding load, but you're not breaking because you get stronger. And uh, there, but there's also deload weeks. <laughs> you know, when you're training, you do take you take rest periods and God, I think gives you those rest periods as well. Um, like God is the perfect training coach. He knows when you need intense, intense stimulus and he knows when you need rest weeks. Right. And the more advanced you get, the tougher the challenge has to get to, to use Mike's right. training metaphor to, uh, to disrupt homeostasis. Right. So Mike's a lot stronger, after however many years of training it is now 10, 15, whatever, 20 years than he was on day one. So what constitutes a workout for him now might right. actually, I, it probably would have just have killed him when he first started training. <laughs> I would guess like it's that bad. Well, the bar and, wouldn't have moved. Like go deadlift 800 pounds the first day you're training. Like it's the bar ain't moving. Yeah. And in the lives of the saints as well, you can see that often things just get tougher. Like, um, St. Anthony in the desert, when he's being tempted um, by this apparition of the, the Queen of Sheba, um, naked, amazingly beautiful, and that's what it takes for him to actually be able to struggle against lust because of how much progress he's made in holiness. So that's the equivalent of like the, the 800 deadlift, I suppose. 
but I like the <laughs> principle, right? So it, things get tougher because you need it to be tougher to get out of your comfort zone. So if, if guys are following along as you're listening, and I hope some people do, this is Genesis 37 to 50. I'll give you a really quick rundown of some of the basic things we're going to talk about. And then we can get into hearing the guys' thoughts on some of the important bits for us as men, what we can learn from the story. So the, the big point we want to look at is how uh, Joseph's ordeal of slavery ends up because of the plan of providence um, working for the good, like for himself and his family as well. So things you're going through that in the moment might feel bad can actually work out well. And Mike gave an example of that with that horrible year that he had as well. So Joseph uh, gets sold into slavery by his own brothers because they're jealous of him and the fact that he's their father's favorite. Then he gets bought by the Pharaoh's chief steward, Potiphar, and then actually does his duties well and becomes trusted by him. But next challenge is uh, Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph and, you know, he stays chased. He refuses. And then she falsely accuses him of making advances towards her, gets imprisoned because of the false accusations. Uh, while in prison, he interprets the dreams of Pharaoh's butler and baker and then gets promoted to governor of Egypt after interpreting Pharaoh's dreams next and then helps him uh helps Egypt prepare for famine because he uses his new position. So he's a guy who just seems to rise to the top just because that's who he is. Wherever you put him, even if it's in slavery, um, he finds a way to get recognition for his skills, his prudence. Ends up saving Egypt during the famine. And then um, Jacob's family, so Joseph's relatives, his brothers, uh, they travel to Egypt to escape the famine and then settle nearby. So everything works out well in the end, and there are some really important lessons for us to take from it. The first one I want to talk about is that he, first of all, um, suffers because of his excellence, like because he is highly favored by his father. So you can be put into a difficult position precisely because you stand out, because you have a good reputation for being virtuous. And people say, why is he suffering? He's such a good man. It's because he's a good man. Like, if you're great, you're going to get hate somehow. It just happens. Tim, what do you think about this? It's, sometimes it's your virtue that is the thing that brings suffering upon you. This is the primary engine of suffering in the lives of the blessed is that because they're not they're not self-sabotaging themselves with sin. You know, once saints get to the juncture in their lives, the inflection point where they'd rather die than sin, even venial sin, which many of them state, suffering doesn't go away. And the primary means of the Lord allowing suffering to continue is that good men suffer because of their good. And so this is another one of those talking points, Will, that you and I share that like completely flips the script when you debate an atheist on like the problem of evil in the world. <laughs> it's gay. Like it's so dumb. For one, at the very least, like why do good things happen to bad and why do bad things happen to good people? It's like they don't even know how to define good people. They don't know even to, they don't have the correct like touchstone epistemically to define what a bad thing is get around that but why are you assuming that it's not if you're an atheist that it's not all just like a, a series of coin tosses you know like 50 50s that I, i've never understood that it's stupid why are you assuming that that the idea of concupiscence and the fall doesn't have ramifications in the world temporal ramifications in the world holy cow there's so many stupid talking points you have to get around you have to be such a stupid dipshit to be an atheist but yes when you get when you sift through it all what you come to is okay not only is it not meaningful if a random bad thing happens to a good person but we should expect what, what you know the, the proposition to follow, as you said, it follows that bad things in the form of persecutions from other humans happen extra to good people. That that weak people and mediocre betas absolutely avoid. 
they avoid it the way, you know, Thomas Jefferson talked about the art of life is avoiding suffering. This is just the art of the cowardly life. And so one thing that mediocre people do really, really, really well is slide between the raindrops of at least human scorn, suffering generated by human disagreement with your, your disapprobation of your decisions. So the mediocre just kind of reflexively are always reacting to their, that inbuilt human barometer of approval or do does one or more other humans in the room disapprove of what I seem to be saying? Do they seem to be furrowing their brow? They just shift with the wind. The, the, the friendship disappears when the wind redirects to quote rage against the machine. And um, it, it happens so automatically with everyone but the morally excellent that we forget that this is even happening. It's a constant negotiation process. And that, that human-specific suffering that, that's generated usually by the persecutions of other humans, not liking the moral behavior of the good man, is what, what good men should expect. It's the main reason that cowardly people don't do the good. So it's just an, an amazing talking point that, that almost everybody misses. And I was, I was glad to have it brought up today. And yeah, and Joseph sold out by his brothers, sold out by some hoe who wanted to get with him because, because he's, he's a fly guy. And uh, just, he continually rises like a Phoenix every time someone that, you wouldn't expect to turn killer tries to turn killer. That sounds like it's an awesome trailer for the Hollywood film. Hopefully there's a talented filmmaker listening. <laughs> and uh, Mike, I'm wondering whether you've noticed that as you have been growing very rapidly in virtue from what I know of your story with your, your past degenerate days, although well, obviously none of us ever entirely leaves his Generate days behind us. We're still living through them right now and until we get to heaven, hopefully one day. And we're perfect. We've always got some degeneracy with us to struggle against. And that's what growing in virtue means. Have you noticed that sometimes it's brought tough situations into your life? Absolutely. Real quick, before I even get to that, I clued in that this was Joseph of the Old Testament, which you guys did say, and not St. Joseph. So Tell the, everybody listening, and then Tim texted me too. He goes, I thought it was St. Joseph as well. Um, I, I'm sorry for the confusion there. St. Joseph obviously is based as well. <laughs> but to the topic <laughs> and re relevance here, because obviously it's been a slow morning for me. Um, <clears throat> I think what uh, people, I guess, maybe don't want to uh, recognize or understand is that the pain of suffering uh, because you're good will never trump the pain of suffering because you just want to blend in and ride the fence. They think that they're somehow avoiding suffering when in fact they're embracing it even more so, but it is a vain kind of suffering and not a redemptive kind of suffering. Um, wow. And it's uncomfortable. And I, it's a cheesy quote that I, I, I say to a lot of the guys that I work with too. It's like, listen, um, either you, you choose hard or hard is inevitably, inevitably going to choose you and it's going to break you. It's kind of like the difference between, um, suffering against your lustful proclivities and not watching pornography, not self-abusing. There's a, there's a sanctification that comes from that versus just um, conceding to the fact that you're addicted to, to, to porn. There's an infinitely greater suffering that comes with that than, than the opposite. And I've never been one to shy away from speaking the truth or, or, or being, being honest. And that's certainly gotten me in these types of situations. Um, and I, I can't properly describe the, the sort of the spiritual, fortitude that that builds it's kind of intangible but it's there and it and it also helps you withstand the the conflict that inevitably comes up in in life as well there is a resilience that is built through those situations mm -hmm. and i think we're kind of seeing the fallout of, of of a society or at least with men that want to avoid this kind of suffering i want to embrace comfort and don't, don't really realize that the comfort brings a different kind of suffering that's infinitely harder to to, to, to push through um and i think all even with a lot of christians a lot of catholics there's a fundamental lack of trust in god when these situations arise 
right? It's easy to throw your hands up and say, why me? And this is why saints are so mentally well-ordered and mentally healthy is that they knew where they were going. They, their posture was oriented toward eternity and the gift of the, of the time to come, the life after death. And so there was a trust in God that I hope to even come remotely close to when these times occur. And I remember Mike sort of, I guess, most recent brush with an extreme situation that made me fall down in praise and worship of God is when my wife had a horrific miscarriage in the end of 2022. Um, and the year subsequent was the really difficult year I went through, obviously. But I remember us being at the hospital and she cried out and I went in and we 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 saw this little baby. What was going to be a baby. And I was faced with this, like the incredible power of God and how the fragility of life and how he can quickly breathe life into our nostrils from the dust or just stamp it out altogether. And that made me want to go home and fall flat on my face in worship and in, and in prayer and in praise. This would be before I became a Catholic. And there was a, a kind of faith and spiritual resilience that I built, I built through that time and going through that tremendous pain and seeing that, that nothing else really has come close to. Um, that might be an aside point, but, um, suffering for good, uh, is is the ultimate good and we forget that that's that's part and parcel for the walk if you're truly really, truly being a catholic and really truly being a christian do we forget what jesus said in the gospels um you'll be persecuted because of me embrace it you know mm. if you lose your job and this is why i respect will will tim you guys you know tim getting booted off a of patreon not capitulating and same thing with you will for the patriarchy lecture is, is a beautiful example of that now look at your guys's lives is that not a testament to divine providence and walking through that suffering like a man Right. You mentioned fortitude there, Mike. And what I like about Joseph's story is really it shows how the true foundation of fortitude is faith and fearing God only. And um, he doesn't complain and whine about the bad things that are happening to him. It would have been so tempting to as well. Instead, he just stays steadfast and allows all these challenges to help him to grow. And Nick, this idea that trials help us grow in virtue, if we can face them with fortitude, that's got to be the key to masculine formation, right? Yeah, man, Tim and Mike, you guys both said some really amazing stuff there. Really good. So I was taking notes the whole time. Um, yeah, it is the key to being a man. And also, if you have by the grace of God, sufficient foundation. And when one of these things does come your way, um, it'll do right by you. And I was contemplating Will, as you were describing the story of Joseph, okay, his brothers sold him into slavery because he was preferred and he was preferred because he was excellent. He was virtuous. There was something preferable about him. I'm like, okay, interesting, which implies that his brothers were not morally excellent. They were in various ways forgettable or perhaps even vicious, obviously sufficiently vicious to sell their brother into slavery. Like that's not cool. Um, and I, I thought to myself, what would have happened if it, if Joseph, let's say was out somewhere and the brothers sold one of their non morally excellent brothers into slavery, how would that brother have dealt with that tragedy? And I realized it probably would have damned him because he would have been resentful at God, would have fought it tooth and nail the whole way. And that resentment would have been his damnation. This is unjust. What have I done? You know, he's angry now, bitter. And <clears throat> that kind of going back to Tim's point, like this problem of evil thing just is unbelievably vapid because like you don't even understand what evil is evil's not pain evil's not suffering inherently uh and for a good man suffering is really good for him it's a blessing and so when i heard mike say that he witnesses this objective tragedy and it sends this upward spiral of him toward like worship of God. 
It's like, oh, that's what happens when a man of moral excellence encounters suffering. Do that same, like run that simulation again with somebody who doesn't have sufficient grace by the gift of God, by the formation of previous sufferings. Run that same simulation again. That person says, you know, horrible things to God or abandons faith and it creates division in them. And so this idea that tragedy or pain or suffering is a mechanism by which God attends to those that he loves. I, th I mean, I'm saying this not because like I've, I have completely accepted this to be true, but I do think it's true. I'm actually thinking through things in my life right now where it's so easy to be solipsistic and myopic that, okay, that might be true narratively for other people, but like this thing that I'm suffering with clearly is not from God. It's not for my benefit. I just got to like solve it and get it out of the way and get like back to the real stuff. Uh, and I think it's in Romans, maybe our uh, former Protestant can <laughs> name chapter and verse here. Um, the Paul says that, there's nothing to be gained. There's no favor from God to be gained if you're punished for your sins, for the, for your wrongdoing. But you gain tremendous favor from God when you are punished specifically because you are a good man. And I mean, that's, that's a verse that'll keep you up at night because then the question becomes, okay, do you want to be a good man? Because if you are, you're going to go through pain like you've never experienced. Mm. And you're lucky. Nick, I remember, sorry, well, just real quick, there's something that you said to me when you, we were visiting. <clears throat> because I think a lot of us, I found myself kind of doing this as of late as sort of like babbling in prayer sometimes. I just got to go back to the basics and just saying these pre-rehearsed prayers or God already knows my requests. And speaking of requests, we were talking about business and success and whatever. And you're like, God hasn't given you precisely that crazy figure in your brain because he loves you too much to give it to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, dude, I'm telling you, I, I reflect on that constantly. Yep. Is that like the way that we experience love is not the way that our feeble little human minds can properly comprehend is that the key precisely withholds those things that you want because he knows it would corrupt you and wedge distance between you and him and that suffering precisely that situation i talked about with the miscarriage he's like i know this is going to happen because it's going to draw you closer to me yep and Praise God. I've now from the worst year of my life to the greatest year of my life. All thank you. Th thanks to God's grace. I think about it all the time, Nick. So I just wanted to mention that. It's mm. awesome, man. That's a great insight. It reminds me of something that our parish priest was talking about a couple of weeks ago, whereby we should see suffering as a blessing, as a gift, because if we go through it with the correct attitude, then it can help to reduce the amount of time that we'll spend in purgatory. And it's far better to suffer now than suffer what are uh, in church teaching the, um, the same pains as the pains of hell. Only difference is they don't last for eternity. Like oh. the sufferings in purgatory are the, the same as in hell. It's just you, you get out of it in the end. So he was saying basically a, a hard life now. It's like Mike was almost saying, well, choose your heart. Um, it's better to have more suffering in life in many ways for your spiritual growth than to have a very easy life. And Aquinas has this really chilling point, um, which is, you know, why do good things happen to bad people sometimes? Uh, because it is precisely that they're bad people and God is basically let, letting them have what they want. Um, they get the luxury, they become fully um, admired in the degeneracy more and more and more. And actually suffering might help to bring them out of it, but it's part of their mm -hmm. punishment, right? The luxury, mm -hmm. the degeneracy is part of the punishment. Yeah. Also the way, the way, and we're defining good and evil are lesser proximate goods, um, parts of the pride of life. Good things are supposed to happen to bad people on, on a lower level, a smaller scale. 
this is literally, if you consult the, the Puritan literature, Devil and Tom Walker, you know, Young Goodman Brown, I'm thinking of the, the Puritan literature from early America, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Washington Irving. Bad people go to the forest at midnight to do a deal with the devil to sign this black book in the forest um, to get stuff. I mean, that's yep. the way the devil tried to even tempt Christ. So, right. so right. <laughs> it's so stupid that atheists are like, well, if he's bad, then why are these, you know, petty and maybe, maybe even significant, but petty proximate goods befalling him? It's like, because he did a deal with the devil. I don't know. Why can Steph Curry make 77 three pointers in a row at practice? I, I'm not saying he did a deal with the devil, but that's not a normal thing, even for an NBA level three point shooter, you know? So I, I'm, this is a very real dimension of the Christian life that I overlooked in my nineties Catholic school upbringing that taught me nothing when I was really basically just an atheist because I thought it was all proverbial or figurative or something like that. People literally, and, and the people in a power, that anything that constitutes what you kids at home think is a household name, whether in politics or sports or celebrity of, you know, the silver screen, if it's a household name, they've probably done a deal with the devil, and it's to get worldly goods and to get longer, li unnaturally longer life. Um you know, you know, there are ways of doing that that are that are deuced. So I, I just, I just think the whole the whole framework is is uh, retardedly simple. Mm. It, it's sort of a weird. Um, what what is this? Uh, uh, what would this relationship be? Inverse correlation between getting things that you think that you want and getting uh, actual good. Which is to say that the best thing, theoretically, that could happen to you on this earth is the story of Job. And you treating that well, you responding perfectly. Uh, um, I think it's the uh, honestia, doing the exact right thing in every single circumstance amidst the greatest suffering. That would be the greatest thing that could happen to you in this life because of what it would afford you ultimately. And the opposite of that is what we desire like every second of every day. Yeah, it, it makes Corey you realize that... Go on, Mike. No, sorry, go ahead, Will. I was just going to say it makes you realize what a challenge the Christian understanding of virtue and masculinity is to the red pill ideas that we talk about often because most guys all they really want to do is find a way to stack as much cash as possible and despite the talk about being outside of the comfort zone just surround themselves with as much comfort as possible deep down yeah it would be i i, I guess then the only man that another one of us men should aspire to be like. If what we're identifying as goods are worldly goods, if a man wants to say, well, I, I would like the worldly goods that another man has, the only man that they should perhaps look to who has those worldly goods is one who uh, probably had to have lost everything first. And didn't didn't even try to get them outright. I would imagine because I don't know that any man who got what he wanted, what he set out to get, would be a man worth envying or aspiring to be. Or it's and maybe that's, that's go ahead. no. Finish your thought, Nick. Sorry. Just totally thinking out loud. Maybe that's where this um, concept of of being anointed as king in the Old Testament has some utility. Like we, the Western idea that has possessed men is that if you labor, you can become a king. But the wealth and the power that the kings of the Old Testament had was not 
merit based whatsoever. It was an office that they were tapped for by God. They were anointed and then they were given sufficient graces to wield that level of power and influence. And then if they stumbled, you know, even in their stumbling, like God gave them guardrails because he wanted that person like with David, right? He, he sins horribly, adultery, fornication, and murder, but he was a man after God's own heart. And God's like, okay, but I'm going to walk you through this because it's really important that you're still King and you still lead my people well. And I just think there's a tremendous amount of arrogance that the Western ambitious man has that, well, I will earn my way to kingship. And trust me, when I get there, I'm going to be sufficiently virtuous to wield this power. The hell you are. Yeah, one one idea about the the devil's rebellion, all the fallen angels, is that they wanted to get to heaven by their own efforts and there's a parallel with what you're saying there nick that the the pride at the heart of that vision of success is that if you just work hard enough by yourself you can make it happen without god's grace you don't need him yeah so the other point that i wanted to bring up about joseph and this might seem really simplistic but i think it's super important is that when he becomes a slave, he's just a really good slave. He does it really well. Like all the stuff that is asked of him, all the duties that are imposed on him, he just excels at them. He doesn't say, I'm not doing that. Like this is beneath me. Who do you think you are treating me as a slave? He just does the slave duties really well. And I think there's something so important there for men in how you can look at all the duties for whatever your state in life is doing those things well day to day. That's how you can ascend, not by pridefully imagining that it's all beneath you and you need to be doing something else with your time. He was just a really good slave after that was his situation. He just threw himself into that. Tim, what do you think about this? You're the same as me. Loads of, duties every day keeping you busy and for some guys it would seem like you know we don't ever really get to have uh, much me time or whatever else um, people think men are supposed to do with themselves like wh where's all your time to relax you've always got um seven kids trying to keep you busy um don't you feel like a slave to your family like that's something i hear quite a lot it's interesting. I was thinking about this the other day. A lot of times, if I have just a half hour, I'll, I'll, I'll just slip outside in the driveway and try to shoot free throws um, and clear my mind. So I've, I've coped with whatever being busy for, for 35 years now, um, to, literally since I was like eight years old. And now what will happen, because I'm really close with my kids, is um, one or two of them, I'm usually thinking Pip will be the first one, well, if they hear me slip out because we have the house alarm, we'll come out there and you have to bite your tongue because um, my first inclination is like, oh, man, like even 20 or 30 minutes alone, I can't get. But, you know, the ones that follow you out there are like, hey, dad, I just want to come out and rebound for you. <laughs> that's what that's what my my daughter Pip will say. And it's it's so touching. And she's like, I, I won't talk or anything. And I'm like, no, no, we could we could chat a little bit. But she, she didn't even do that. So. Yeah, there is something to um, not just suffering silently, in, because if, sometimes if you keep your mouth shut, you're like, man, I'm really glad I, I did, because it would have hurt their feelings if I had said anything. But um, embracing the, this is a very small kind of suffering, when you're already kind of tired and you need some alone time, just not getting it. Um, beautiful things follow. A lot of times I'll get in a really good, big conversation with one of the kids. Um, you, you know, usually it's, it's the one who came out there and is just trying to be really thoughtful anyway. And it also shows me that what I'll literally do is I'll just be like, well, I got like seven or eight minutes of alone time. And then it turned into a, a good conversation with Pitt or just bonding time. So that's kind of two for one. I mean, you... 
You have to be, I, I guess I would say attitude is everything. Cause I, I know there are people out there that listen to this show that have more kids than seven and only in a really contraceptive anti-life, anti-family, anti-child milieu would, would seven kids be considered a lot. It does sometimes feel like a lot's happening around the house and, and, and every man wants some alone time. But um, I guess Part of, I think the number one aspect of family life that I think is beautiful when you do have a bigger family is how adaptable things are. Like literally, you can just go, okay, well, I got five minutes of alone time now, and um, and now I'm just gonna have a, a nice time with with X. And you can get kind of like a power nap. You can get really refreshed. Right? I know I, I went like really specific on the call, of the question, but I think there's beauty to it. You can, you can get a lot of like disproportionately restful rest from an eight minute power nap. And, and same thing. You don't need the indulgent self-indulgent. Like I need a me time. I need a week long vacation to catch up with just me to catch up on me time. You don't need that. <laughs> you catch it through little, you know, maybe you, it's also a thing. If I try to just go run errands for a half hour, an hour alone, um, Nick knows this, that the kids all come running. That's, that's not, <laughs> that's all of them. And sometimes I'll, with that one, I'll be like, no, no, I'm just going to go guys. Uh, but usually I'm like, okay, let's, let's take one or two and, and we'll take turns. Um, my, my point is just how adaptable is I think about, um, Aragorn, returning in in uh, the two towers to to the throng at Edoras and he's like you know he's he's basically they thought he was dead he fell off a cliff and he has scouting report basically that that the that the evil enemies from Mordor are coming and he's getting all ready to fight that night because the, the enemies are going to be at the gates at night and they're like you need to rest for like Kimberly and Legolas tell him you need to rest for 20 or 30 or 45 minutes because you're no good to us half dead. Um, I like in emergent situations or just life in general, the it's it's cheery to me, the idea that you don't always need the what the what the flabby, stupid, self-indulgent, like normal people think you need by way of indulging yourself. You don't need that. Uh, a lot of these are, we're talking temperance, touch and taste. You just need a little bit of rest and a little bit of food and a little bit of alone time. And you can keep going and and be patient and loving through it all and not even not even complain about it to your wife or your kids. I think I think there's, that adaptability is my favorite challenge in, in family life. And, and you don't get a lot of alone time Unless you want to um, send a message to the kids like, hey, look, I, I golf all day Saturday and Sunday because I need alone time because it's really exhausting being around you. Yeah, you could do that. But then you ruin everything you've you've struggled to build. You're sending <laughs> the opposite message. Like, I don't like being around you. My whole message is family life is beautiful. I like being around my wife more than anyone. I like being around my kids. And, you know, you, you could compromise it by yelling at everyone and be like, you're not, I'm not going to be me till I get my alone time, <laughs> but you ruin it all. Yeah. And Mike, what Tim's describing there of just the, the daily commitment and the adaptability and coping with whatever struggles life brings your way day to day. It's a great reminder, like in the Joseph story that, we don't need to go on fancy one, two week men's retreats where we get cradled by another man and cry in a hot spring. Like the work <laughs> that you need, the work that you need is actually all around you, right in front of your face. Be faithful to that. Do that well. And that's the most important thing. Do you know the video I'm talking about is on social media, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just in case that sounded really weird. But yeah, I, I, I saw that and just thought, isn't it crazy that people think that they need that? I've really noticed this. It's a, and it all comes from, I mean, there's many things that comes from specifically, but um, talking about Joseph and being the best slave, it's the, it's just speaking to good stewardship of your life and where your feet are planted at any given moment, doing everything to the glory of God. 
right? It, things really started to unfold for me and my contentment just skyrocketed when I looked at all of my situations as a way to glorify God to the best of my ability to just be a good steward. Because what I found in the, in the climb with success or with lifting, you're always looking at that next goal. And it's always good to have, you know, some semblance of ambition kind of keeps you going. Having a bit of a chase in your life is good as a man. Um, I think that's, you know, God wired us to build and, and, and to do things, but also to never be discontent. And I think discontentment comes from a fundamental lack of good stewardship of what you have and the duties that you have in front of you. And speaking to Tim's point, I feel that I don't have seven kids, obviously, you know, but God willing, we'll have more and more and more. But I feel that you, you, you feel like you have such little time for yourself, but the little time that you do have for yourself is that much sweeter. And you don't need that much more, that much time for yourself, it, you know, it, and where you can decrease, God can increase. And ultimately that gives you the graces necessary to handle those duties on a day to day. I found that more and more and more. And what God's really revealed to me is that I'm greedy and selfish by nature, yeah. greedy and selfish. Like yeah. tr truthfully, I think back to me being single, I'm like, man, I was, I was such a prick, greedy and selfish. And what's helped me so much is having my kids to live for and my wife that I'm have this duty that's bound to them that even the little things like my daughter coming down and me training and her wanting to spend time with me in the back of my head, obviously I want to be alone and, and train and lift these weights that could maybe snap me in half, but her being there means, means more. And that's where I can decrease. God can increase. Um, and, and then the same thing on the greed side of things where it was really revealed to me after this, doing this novena to our lady of sorrows, I have to give. And so I had to embrace that suffering of that scarcity of, Oh man, like oh, money. I don't want to get, and giving just unlocked a whole new set of graces that were poured over me. Um, so I think that really does speak to good stewardship, doing everything to the glory of God and where you can decrease, he can increase. And it's all the better for us and our, and our souls and where we're headed. Yep. I, one, one thing like reading between the lines of Mike's comment and Tim's as well about kids joining in with like alone time. There's a, a framing here which is so common in culture that um, time with dad has to be like chit chat and the way in which men are presented there by assumption is like um, really talkative and intimate in that way, in the same way, like a, a chat with mom might be. And sometimes you can just spend kids with your, spend time with your kids doing something quiet together. Like it doesn't mm -hmm. always have to be talking the whole time mm -hmm. and you can teach them about masculinity in that way too. So I almost always do the gym with my 15 year old son. And when Nick came here, we just did what we normally do, which is go in, warm up, train, talk a little bit, but not a whole bunch. Cause we're both just relaxing while lifting. I might sometimes say like 10 words to him, like don't mm -hmm. do another rep, stop. Right. And that's it. Whole workout. Then we come in, he says, thanks dad. Good workout. And yep. I was laughing because Nick said at one point, man, you, you guys are like the quietest lifters I've ever seen. And I was thinking sometimes we do go through a whole session without talking much at all. And um, that's still really good time together. And it's me showing an interest in him and vice versa. And it's a good bonding. Yeah, the a theme here, I can't, I can't reach it, but I got screw tape letters back there. And um, one of the things that Wormwood um, is instructed to do by screw tape is to make sure that his patient, as he calls him, is covetous of his time, uh, but but very specific kinds of time that like the small inconveniences and changes in the day are quote, robbing him of his time. Like it's mine and this isn't how I wanted to spend my day and now it's different and this is upsetting to me. And, uh, hearing Mike talk about he's like, I'm selfish and I'm greedy. It's like, I'm not even married yet. And I'm starting to realize just how ferocious my, my preferences are my little preferences on how I like things to be. And it's not bad to have preferences, but if those preferences being pushed against by no one's, infraction by no one's malice by virtue of existence itself if that makes you upset <laughs> that's a feminacy it's so effeminate to be mm -hmm. so covetous of your little preferences that your peace is is fragmented because of that 
and uh, Hormozzi says says that I think, or maybe Hormozzi and Chris Wilkins or whatever, um, the magic you are looking for is in the work that you're avoiding. The magic you're looking for is in the work that you're avoiding. You don't need that retreat. You don't need the ayahuasca trip. You need that when your daughter wants to go rebound for you. That boom right there. Okay. Treat that well. Do that exactly perfectly in the exact precise way that you're supposed to treat that exact moment. All right. You pass that test. Move on to the next one. The magic right. you're looking for is in the work that you're avoiding right there. And Isabel uh, has shared this quote with me before, and it's it's something that I aspire to and kind of hearing what you guys talk about with having families, um, maybe you'll find it invigorating as well. But I'm not going to do justice to the quote, but it was something to the effect of that the greatest prayer that a father can offer is his sigh of exhaustion as he lays his head down on the pillow at night. That if he truly exhausted himself throughout the day, that was the prayer that it, he treated every single moment in the way that he was supposed to treat it is a greater prayer than if he did, you know, the divine hours or the offices or whatever it's called. Mm. Um, yeah. I think that's everything I had to say about that. You know, you realize it's so quickly when you have children and when you're married, you learn to do things in less than ideal circumstances all the time and you learn to do them well. So what I mean is with my lifting, for example, that was something that was like, that was my time in the afternoon and all my whole day pre-workout meals, sodium levels, hydration levels, rest <laughs> levels would be geared. And I was way weaker back then than I am now. I'm like peak strength right now. And, and sometimes it's four hours since I've had a meal. I'm like barely hydrated. I'm on four hours of sleep, but I just show up and I get it done. And there's something from, you know, the 60s and 70s and 80s, those powerlifters back then, those strong men back then, they would just get off of work 12 hours working as like a mason or in a mine and they would show up and they do the thing super, super well. And I think that's a kind of grace that God gives us. And so when you kind of let go of those things or these little particularities you have in your diet or your training or what have you, your work, you find your, you grow and there's a virtue to be had there. There's virtue to be had there. You grow in virtue there. And it's so interesting. I'm like, how is this me that I, I care about training the least? It's the least ideal circumstances, but I'm the strongest that I've ever been. How can this be? Mm. Nothing teaches you that, that, that more than, than, than being a parent and being married. <laughs> That's a great point. So just reminding me, I've I've noticed that, you know, if you if you spend too much time around uh, gym culture and thinking about how much calories you get per day, how often you're eating, all the rest of it, even if you're not into bodybuilding, just strength development or athletic performance, uh, it ends up becoming a thing for you after enough years. And like if you if you don't get the right kind of meal or the right time of meal, your ferocious preferences can make you annoyed. And I, I've just made a point out of trying to detrain that in myself. No eating until 3 p.m. on Wednesdays and Fridays, like every week. And you just notice it begin to surface when you say, no, I'm deliberately going to combat that. You don't realize how bad it gets until you do something that's like the opposite of it. So if anyone else is um, resonating with the comments that Mike was making there and Nick as well, I would do something in the opposite direction and you will bring it out of yourself faster. Yeah. The, um, the, the next point about Joseph that I think we should talk about is when he is uh, tempted by Potiphar's wife. And I think this is great. I mean, my thought is going to be about St. Joseph today and chastity, but th this is here as well. Um, and what's so good, I think, for guys who are struggling with um, lust is two big lessons. So he avoids her as much as he can, like as far as possible. He just doesn't want to be around her. Why? Because he actually has a humble like mistrust of himself. He doesn't have this big swagger that any woman can come on to him and there's nothing she could ever do to tempt him. No, he's actually kind of afraid of her and says, I don't want to be around you. I'm going to try and avoid you as much as possible because I know myself, I know the dangers. So that's a good reminder about avoiding occasions of sin. And the next thing is that um, he prays straight away. Like he doesn't depend on himself to be able to overcome it. When he's tempted, he prays. So avoiding occasions of sin and then praying. And that's so good because 
God won't give you temptations that are too great for you to overcome as long as you're asking for his help to get through it. Tim, I think this is really underestimated, not just with lust, but with in general, whether it's temptations to um, despair, vain glory, whatever it might be that a man's struggling with. This idea is so common in self-help culture that you can just do it yourself if you find the right book, right? Or, or watch the right video or listen to the right podcast. You can do it by yourself somehow. Yeah, you, you can't. <laughs> Uh, God is at the very least the, the 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 final cause of all of all of your grace and everything good that comes from you. And if you you know, I don't, I'm not trying to open the, the the trickiest debate ever had in Christian intellectual life was is um, Molinism versus you know the the Bonyezi, the Thomistic Bonyez on. Um, precisely this issue like com free will compatibilism grace how active is grace how active is the human free will um it's really the only debate that the pope ever shut down but it's an interesting one and we i was kind of revisiting it i, I do about once every year it's uh at the very least we know like nothing good happens to you that god didn't sign off on you know, may, maybe if, if Thomas and Banyas are right, basically God, God even moves your will. You can't do any act without God efficiently causing your will to move. That seems, you know, I don't want to get into the whole thing. That seems ostensibly to destroy free will, says Molina and the Jesuits. But the point is, yeah, you can't, nothing good happens that God hasn't signed off on, at least fi finally. And see, I just, the idea that you know you, you know a real man makes his own luck it on the surface it makes a lot of sense because god does want us to cooperate with grace and so you do have to take action but ultimately it's a, 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 a an open-minded prayerful attunement god what is your will what do you want me to do is the expression of of the christian equipoise and that makes it seem like being passive rather than active is the attitude to have and i think that's that's why what you're describing here i mean if you go full sort of non-denominational protestant sometimes those guys lean into talks about grace but it can also be a lot of act or else you're going to have a terrible life um the truly Catholic approach to this is pray and act in cooperation with God's grace. Grace builds upon nature, and um, this is this is what we saw that example beautifully by Joseph. I mean, embrace your throneness, which you kind of asked me about before. Well, it's like excel wherever you are thrown, bloom where you're planted. Always give it your best and do so prayerfully, and God will see that you excel right exactly and tim that's kind of um really apposite comment because the next thing i wanted to bring in was this verse from psalm 127 behold thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the lord so if you take that approach then the blessings are going to come because joseph's um the iron chains of slavery end up being chains of gold in the end and the way he gets there is by committing in principle to death before dishonor. And they can take all kinds of things away from him, but not his good conscience and his standing before God. So he keeps that as like the North Star of his life. And you're on track. If that is the case, you're always on track. You're going to get somewhere good, even if you don't know where it might be right now. Difficult to do, though because there are all kinds of other scary things that take our attention moment to moment. But if we can remember that the only thing we should really be afraid of is God, then that's the key to being masculine in our everyday commitments. Um, Nick, this idea that God is the only thing for us to fear, what do you think the main thing, apart from God, that men tend to fear is? Thank <laughs> you.
Oh gosh. I don't know if there's one primary one, I would say maybe, uh, work, hmm. um, ha having to labor to, to sustain themselves and others. So the responsibility of taking care of themselves and others, and that that requires effort. Mm. Um, I think the loss of respect. Yeah. Men really want to feel honored and respected and admired and consulted. And so anything that detracts from that, I think is, is very scary. Um, and a note that I just had that I wonder if this is sort of an, a general human fear. Um, you know, I also will not even begin to open up the debate that Tim was talking about, not because it's hard, but because I don't know anything about it. Um, but when hearing him set up those two sides, for some reason, it was the first time I considered, you know, we're trying to discuss, you know, what, what a woman is in our movie and that she is actualized. She's perfected through her submission to God via her husband. And I was thinking like, what is a, okay, but what's a human person? And there seems to be an attachment that I've definitely felt with the question of, do I need God to do good things? And I think the attachment comes from the desire not to be a creation that participates in goodness, but to be the creator of goodness. Like, well, why can't I be the actual cause of goodness itself? Well, because you're not, because that's not what you are. You're a creation. And what you're being asked to do is participate in goodness. And that participation is, because I'm what I'm picturing is like, you know, Mike even mentioned this earlier that the more we decrease, the more God increases in our life and our behavior. And like what I sort of feel when I hear that is like, this, but, but, wait, 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 but I want to be great. I want to have caused my own goodness. And if I'm continuing to decrease and the only thing that's good about me is basically the Holy Spirit and, and the Logos manifesting itself within me, then where did I go? I'm gone. And that's sort of where this thought came from that, well, maybe that's, Maybe that fear is because what I'm trying to do is be God. I'm trying to be the creator of goodness instead of a creation, which is just simply participating in goodness itself, which is what Adam and Eve were asked to do in the garden. Just walk with me. You're not here to make anything. You're here to enjoy it and participate in the goodness that I made. I was the one who made it. I just want you to, you know, rebound for me, basically. <laughs> Yeah, this is why the litany of humility is such a masculine prayer, isn't it? Just prayed it this morning. I was yeah. just gonna, I was just gonna bring that up. Yeah, such it's, a good one. that's it's a brutal one. It's like I'm mm. pray every time I pray it, I'm like, why am I asking for this stuff? Like, no, but I do want to be consulted. I do want to be admired. I don't want people to lie about me. I don't want to be ridiculed. I don't want any of these things that I'm praying for. Why in the world would I pray this? Like by the end of the prayer, I'm like, okay, so I'm gone. I have been reduced to atoms at the end of that prayer to add on to your point nick i think people ultimately fear it not being about them yeah which is why people, what mary said is yeah. like truly radical they want to be the center point of their, their their own life there's an aversion to humility and there's a fear of suffering and all of these things are inextricably linked because it's all rooted in pride Mm, and self-aggrandizement right yeah pride pride is in all sins it's in all of them so it makes sense to me that the litany of humility would be so tough because it strikes right at the root of it all so if if you're a guy who hasn't prayed that before type it into google start you'll be challenged and the other thing just to finish off because i'm running out of time but i'm sure some of you guys are too I just wanted to mention the way that Joseph treats his brothers as well is also really masculine. So yeah, he wants them to repent, um, but he wants them to actually amend their lives. He right. doesn't make a big deal um, out of his newfound power. It's not like, ha ha, look at me now, kiss the ring. Instead, it's 
you, you need to change um, for your benefit for the future. And uh, James 5.20, uh, he who causeth a sinner to be converted from the error of his way shall save his soul from death and shall cover a multitude of sins. So Joseph doesn't return evil for evil. And another way of putting it is, is that he is the bigger man, right? There's no mean-spirited or small-minded vengeance there. And it would have been so easy for him to fall into that. So it just shows you how um, forgiveness and being willing to move forward with magnanimity is something that helps you grow in masculinity. Otherwise, you're always stuck at the level of those same petty injuries that is going to keep you trapped, I think. It's really difficult to do this, but it's so important. Otherwise, you just live in the past constantly. And it's like you haven't truly accepted that the suffering was sent by God and did help for you to grow. Tim, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, the, the litany of humility is amazing. And uh, yeah, the, the the test is one that we all almost fail necessarily, the, the litmus test, because... You, like Nick said, you do feel reduced to atoms just by by looking, by glimpsing through that prayer. <laughs> um, and that's the whole point. So the um it's it's like the the the, the form is the format. Um form is function with that prayer. Like, yes, it's it goes against your nature, not even necessarily all your fallen nature. It goes against the the nature that that anybody has. Hey, I want to be, I want to be useful for others. Even it's like in in mm -hmm. even that's be stripped of a man. Um, men want to be useful, so the, it, a lot of it sifts your fallen um, sort of secondary, newfound nature after after we became concupiscent and our, our human nature was altered by sin, original sin. But a lot of it's even like, no, this is something that's naturally good about men. And we're being asked to sublimate it. And um, that's the, the real challenge. I mean, once you get past doing you know, you accomplish the tasks that the mediocre find really, really overwhelming, that the Christ poses these impossible tasks. Then you get into the real work of of being a good man. And that is loving your enemies, like you said, overcoming the the pettiness and the um self-dealing and the the serving serving your enemies the exact same poison they served you. You you get over that. And it's like love your enemies. Um, don't even give into the, the lust of the eyes, let alone the lust of the flesh. Don't, uh, do good and ask that nothing even comes from it. That doesn't just mean material recompense. That means spiritual or a putative rep recompense, the kind of thing that, you know, where your, your reputation goes up, just do good and don't think about it at all. Don't even think about how if you're really holy, you're getting to heaven. I mean, that that's a fine is one of the three motivators for a good act. But I mean, man, the standards just keep getting higher and higher. <laughs> Once we put aside all this shit and get to the work of being a truly good Christian man. It's the highest standard the world has ever seen. It's the perfection standard. Jesus said, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Right. And that challenge is the thing that we need. Otherwise, we would think we could do it all ourselves and that would be the worst thing for us spiritually. Uh, Matthew 20, 22, can you drink the chalice that I shall drink? I mean, the answer really to that challenge is um, not unless you help me. I can't do it unless you help me. And Christ's life shows you what the litany of humility actually looks like lived. Yeah. And that's the only person who's done it um, perfectly like that. And it's too much for us to do by ourselves. And the story of Joseph has lots of great examples of that. Obviously, he's a type of Christ. Tim's made the great point before that the whole of the Bible, even the Old Testament, is ultimately about Christ. And it's important to bear that in mind when you're looking at the, the typology of the Old Testament. But Christianity as a challenge laid down to men as a hard path to grow in masculinity. Can you drink the chalice that I shall drink? Joseph's story is just a great way to think about some ways we can start to grow in those ways practically. Uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts, guys. If you've got anything you want to add just to round up with, go for it. 
yeah. I just want to finish real quick with a phrase, just real real quick, and it's something that I I try to keep the front of my mind every day. Um, uh, Anything good that comes from me doesn't come from me. Everything bad that comes from me comes from me. Mm -hmm. Wise. Let's try to keep that at the front of my mind. Yeah. Go ahead, Nick. Just to build off that, if in contrasting that with Pharaoh from Exodus, Pharaoh from Exodus was so... uh, clinging to his power that he was willing to, you know, go into the the Red Sea and lose everything. Joseph, having surrendered himself completely to his fate, then got the power Mm. and got to, quote unquote, enjoy it with an open hand, whether it was in there or not, he didn't care, but he got to keep it. He got the power itself. And this idea of the complete reduction, just again, going back to, I'm trying to figure out this idea, like, okay, we're, we're answering what a woman is, but what a human being is, if what Mike said is true, which it is, then what that means is what a human is at the very bottom is when you completely remove everything that is not of God, what you are left with is simply a consciousness that is there to walk with God to have the beatific vision, to accept it. And that accept that acceptance is ours, right? Because we do have free will. That choice to say yes to God is ours. But we have to remove the obexes of it, the obstacles to saying yes to that. And basically everything, uh, quote unquote, about us doesn't want that. We have to be completely humiliated, completely emptied of ourselves in order to say yes to that. Um, and this is in, in great contrast to the Eastern perspective that you reduce everything and also jettison your consciousness, that your goal is, is total annihilation and oneness with matter, oneness with God. It's not, you still exist. It's just basically everything except for your ascent to God is worthless. And so I, I'm, I'm thinking that our actualization, our telos, you know, what a, what a man is, what a human person is, um, ironically seemingly paradoxically actually only is manifested when you obliterate everything else except that and i right and i don't understand it but all the saints end up very different from each other yeah right they're not the same the something about them is obliterated but that is what makes their personalities flourish in their uniqueness exactly they become actualized in somehow this quote-unquote annihilation or humiliation process so clearly we have it backward you don't actualize yourself right exactly tim have you got any final thoughts yeah i like that i would say the saints are so interesting and different from each other through their virtue natural variegation comes from natural virtue and actually um people that do evil things do it in the name of being interesting a lot of times and they all end up the exact same it's just like a sludge (laughs) That was a great, great episode. I actually had, I was going to tell you guys I had to bounce, but um, th- I thought this was a great one. Cool. Well, we're going to talk about Job the next time we do one of these biblical manhood episodes, but it's been great to talk to you guys about Joseph today. Have a good week. God bless you. Take care, God guys. God bless you guys. God bless. Take Peace. care. Peace.